Okay, um, we'd like to invite up our next speaker, uh, who is Dr. O.K. Hathama from Sweden. He's an emeritus professor of internal medicine, small animals, and diploma in internal medicine involved to data in research primarily on various aspects of health and wellness in dogs. He's a scientific advisor and veterinary consultant to the Swedish Kennel Club since 1978, a member of Vasava Hereditary Defects Committee, and also co-author of a chapter on internal and national approaches to health reforms for brassicephalic breeds in dogs, focused on health and wellness, a complete guide for professionals. Thank you, and now I'm finally here. Um, due to uh, flight connections, I was unable to make it. I was intended to do two talks, and I missed my first. So now I have squeezed them into one, which I hope that you appreciate, not taking too much time, but I will take some time because I think I have quite a lot of messages I would like to share with you. Actually, the second one, the one you might expect to, to listen to now, the breed-specific instructions, which is a very specific tool that has been developed, I will actually sneak that into this presentation because I think that is a successful collaboration. It's a very good collaboration. So what I will do, I'll try to bring up things with you and discuss what we have done well together. And that's quite a lot. That means that we are good at collaboration and we should continue to be good at collaboration. But I will also discuss some of the challenges we have when we might have different views or different experience and background tackling it differently. And I would call that challenges rather than failure. And I might sneak in at the end some more, not controversial, but things that can be discussed so that we try to find better ways to collaborate. So let's see what we have and what we actually have done, because that's the most funny part of it. So could you just move it first? I'm a little bit shake on my hands, so I have assistance for that. But the assistant left with it. That was funny. Yeah. Um, we are very many, as you know, involved in responsibility for genetic health. On one side, we could talk about the owners, the breeders, the bread clubs, and the kennel clubs who have their responsibility. And we could also talk at the other side, maybe we could call it the vets, veterinary organization, speciality groups, and the panels serving for that. And I did add the companies after having heard the lectures yesterday, and I should maybe have added also legislation and welfare organizations. We are all involved and we have collaborative responsibility for doing the best for dogs. So the next please. I'll, I'll focus my, my presentation, though, on those mentioned in the title. The breeders, shuriadis, and veterinarians, they are, have a responsibility to wisely select the breeding stock to ensure the best health. And let's stick more, more or less to that and don't bring up other issues. We also share a responsibility for. Next, please. Breeders are the ones ultimately making the breeding decisions. They might even help assist doing that. The next slide shows how we have different but various capacities to assist in that decision. That's the show judges take their share and the veterinarians taking their share. Next, please. I, I, I skipped a presentation of the tools and responsibility of the show judges and the shows because I knew that, that uh, Benke would do an excellent explanation of that today. So I focus on saying that what we can do from the veterinary side is, of course, to, to find out clinical sites of diseases whenever it occurs. But more importantly, so in, in the breeding uh, advice is to help screening dogs for, for, uh, for 
predict the clinical outcome in an individual that has not yet got clinical signs. And also by that, they indicate superior and inferior breeding stock. Next. These screening programs that now have been in force for quite a long time have all been developed in very close collaboration between these stakeholders. It's not that it comes from the top or the bottom, it neither either just comes from the bottom, it needs collaborative efforts by those stakeholders. And I haven't to, to forget the analysis. Yes, please. We have actually lived with more than half a, more than half a century screening for hip dysplasia. We have, have for more than a half of a century, uh, quarter of a century worked with elbow dysplasia. And um, we have since 2005 uh, had the opportunity to also use molecular genetic tests. So let's bring up uh, one of the successful stories. It started for more than 16 years ago. And it is, as always, a breeder's or a breed, breed background. When, when the, the state operated operation in, in, in Sweden for the armed forces found they were not able to have their dogs functioning because of something which was a problem in their back. They started to just take radiographs and see what the hell is the background of this. So it, everything springs out of a, a desire to predict the clinical outcome at an earlier age so that you can use that for deciding if you will train the dog. But then it comes also that that is also, of course, a good, good way of predicting a suitable breeding animal. And that was taken on in Germany, but taken in the US, and it's actually most of the screening programs, or almost all of the screening is based on that simple technique that was used half a century ago. Uh, next, please. And I shouldn't always bring up Swedish experiences, I have a tendency to do that, but I would say that all these screening programs, wherever they have been performed, worldwide, they have been successful if they have been implemented. You have had to have sometimes a lot of screening going on and not used properly to select the breeding stock. People believe that just taking x-rays of a dog would make it better. You have to make it used. We have, are fortunate to have a very effective kennel club in Sweden, which means that we have very, very many dogs screened, which means that we don't only have results from the individual dogs, we also have the possibility to follow the progeny making breeding index. So by that, we have had a very successful story, but like others, we have seen a decline in that success over the last years, because we have been so successful from the beginning. As soon as you start to use non-effective dogs in breeding, you will have a very, very good impact on what's going Later on, it becomes more and more difficult. Let's see what happens in, in L. Oh, well, it's another success. Um, I don't know if you know, but finally, we were able to gather the panelists worldwide, or to be so, sad to say, mostly European uh, um, panelists. We had Andre Velabolos with us from Mexico, but uh, we would have liked to have more people to so see that we can, can harmonize because there are always critics that they are not doing the same. This final meeting, which was a row, and the last time they were gathered was 2007, so it was really needed. By good preparation, by good governing, by Nick Salemo, he's actually a dermatologist, but he governed this group so well. So the experienced uh, radiologist who served on that uh, workshop actually did a so good job that they were, they were in agreement themselves and they were actually in agreement with the audience, which is a hope for the future of even better screening programs worldwide. We had 30 panelists from 12 countries and there was a good agreement in the readings, especially after the session. Next. There are challenges to do 
with even with bridging prunes slam like that, because it has gone into various direction. So there are different screening systems in in UK in UFA, and there are even some systems which are more elaborate, which means that we need even more harmonization, and that has calls for harmonization internationally. Next, please. Next. <laughs> there are chances to go further by genomic selection. You have heard a little bit uh, yesterday. And uh, that would, um, especially, I mean, breathing in this is closer. Genomic selection is, is further on. But that could be improved. Next. Let's look at elbow dysplasia, which hasn't been around as a screening program for, for such a long time, but it followed the route of the hip dysplasia screening programs. Next, please. The good thing and the important thing with that is even that program sprang out of the need by breeders. Because the, this group, the multi-stakeholder group, was formed by Bernard Sander Breeder. He kept us together for a long time, and then we have been let loose. But now it serves as a collaborative interaction between all the stakeholders. Next. There, it's, of course, their rule to standardize the procedure, but also to promote its a more widely use of it. Next. There are, as in, in hip dysplasia, a lot of successful development, but we have challenges also with that program. Next, please. Because of that, that disease actually cause clinical problems much earlier in life. It's difficult to get hold of material at the screening time, so they are lost, and they are the worst. So they we must find a way of integrating also clinical cases in our, our screening programs, especially in our health program based on screening. And as with hip dysplasia, it can then be further improved by breeding indexes and genomic selection. There is a workshop plan for 2024 in the same fashion as for hip dysplasia, and that's a hope that we can even there contribute to an even better harmonization between. It has been a little bit more of a difference between different countries regarding elbow dysplasia. We need, would like to bring that together as being as similar as possible. I won't say much about patella luxation. It's, it's out there and it's practiced, and when people use it, it's a good help to predict if that dog will be lame, and it's also especially important to predict if that is a good spreading animal. We have had half a century with inherited eye disorders. Next. Which actually steams back to mostly to a specific disease that was seen much earlier in man, and it took some time until it was seen that, that a similar type of problem was seen also in dogs. So we have had PRA in dogs for a long time, but it was only recent that we got the specific type of PRA uh, alike with the need to Musa. That was actually published last year. But we have screened for it, and as you know, we did, did the next slide, did the phenotypic screening. And that was also based originally that the shepherds in Germany, in, in England, UK, had problem with the sights of their working dogs. The border collies that got blind, and that was a starting point of screening for eye diseases in dogs. Next, please. Next. Regarding the, the, the speciality group for eye diseases is very, very active, and they are very, very good at coming up with new uh, methods to evaluate them, but they're also very good at, at uh, finding new disorders. And we, together with geneticists, they work hard to reveal the background of eye disorders. Next, thanks. So many of the cell programs have um, helped by phenotypic screening, but now we have also got the chance to ba be based on DNA testing, which is, has been a very fortunate in that area. And once again, based on the people 
making readers and dog owners collaborate to send in material and to help to reveal the background and by that finding out the proper genetic testing of it. Next. But of course, some of the eye disorders are like hips and elbows, very complex, and it needs a lot of work to find out the true uh, inheritance and by that the true matters of how to, to select for it. Thanks. And I wouldn't spend time on every one disease that is screenable today, but it's also a lot of good screening going on for various heart diseases. But it's very not, not very harmonized over the world, so it, it calls for a better collaboration within the profession especially to find out how to communicate that in a better way. Next. And as I said, since 2005, we have also got the chance to do molybdenum screening, which has certainly enhanced the purpose. Next, thanks. When Sasha was completely revealed, 2005, it, start, it changed the possibility to get hold of material and to reveal diseases molecularly genetically. Next. We now have a lot of DNA testing, and we touched upon it yesterday. Uh, it has been easy, or had been very successful, to find the single gene diseases, and it works perfectly. We do have a challenge, the complex diseases still, because they are risk genes and not that easy, easy to imply in a breeding program. We have some issues regarding hand panel tests because some countries, it's, it's difficult to make use of them because if someone finds a deleterious gene in those tests, that dog is not eligible for breeding. So we have to handle that in a wise thing so that, that these very powerful tools can, can be used properly. Next. It's with um, all of the programs it's a matter of, of validate the materials, so we don't have craps out there. We need better counseling regarding how to use these tests. Is it the testing companies who should supply that? Is it the kennel club who should supply that? Is it a, is it a specific genetic consultants? We need to have a better way of making proper use of molecular genetic testing. And we need an international normalization. Next. We all have a collaborative responsibility to develop this further. All what we, especially new ones, it's difficult when new disease comes up and everyone goes on it and might not be of the same opinion on how important it is and how to handle it. There is a good need of collaboration between researchers, the veterinarians, and the breeders. Yeah. And there, of course, there are, in the future, a lot of new possibilities going into nutrigenomics and nutraceuticals and going into epigenetics, but that's probably not within my lifetime. Next. We have done, together, FCI, World Small Animal Association, uh, a lot of certificates that serve the purpose of communicating the results of screening programs. We have had international bodies involved in that, both on the phenological uh, side and on the veterinary side. Next. I will just bring in, because we discussed uh, mandatory screening of breeding stock. And that would, of course, be what we are doing that is actually kind of screening of breeding stock for specific purposes. And of course, if it could be arranged well, it would be good if all breeding animals would be uh, examined for the proper. What we have in Sweden and some other countries is actually mandatory screening, mandatory test, mandatory uh, examination of the puppies born. So they have to bring the puppies together to, to, to a vet to check them. And that was originally meant for infectious diseases, but we have introduced more and more tools 
to see if we can indicate the risk of, 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 of um, inherited disorders that, that early, so that makes the, the, the buyers aware that they don't have the, the, the best uh, example. But I think that's something to be considered together with, with schemes for, 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 for the, the breeding stock. Next. Now we come to one it's coming to be a little bit more difficult. We are going to discuss how we together can handle the exaggerated anatomical features. Next. 1968-9, there was a World Congress in Paris where Saki Patsama, who at that time was the president of the Finnish Kennel Club, he was also the president of the, the World Small Animal Association. He brought together information that had been gathered regarding the situation or the relation between exaggerated anatomical features and unhealth. So let's see what comes came out of that. Next. Next. That has actually resulted since then. Oh, go back one. That together there have been introduced changes in the breed standards. There have been addendums to the breed standards. There have been instructions for show judges. There have been a lot of information to breeders and have been enforced breeding rules, as you see at the next slide. Which I see as a good collaborative effort. That's the, if you haven't read them before, those are included and you heard Barbara comment on it. Next, thanks. Since then, there have been introduced other tools to help in that, and that's breed specific instructions, which was the intended talk of mine, and I'll come back to that to talk a little bit about it. At the same time, at the UK, they introduced the breed watch system, and also I'm proud to say that we in initiated a way of gathering people uh, of various stakeholders in dog health workshops since 2012, and it has been repeated up to now. Next. Breed specific instructions is meant to be a complement to the breed standards, bringing the judges aware of where the risks are that they can be exaggerated and by that uh, to, to um, help be aware of the risk, which is intended in all breeding rules by FCI. We've had in already in only 47 breeds. It's decreased now and it gives very uh, more uh, detailed description. I'll go through it quickly because of the time limit. Next, please. That was the title of the talk. Next. Yeah, uh, it is next. A good thing to know about this, the whole thing behind that was actually initiated by an old breed judge, Joram Budigor. Does anyone old enough to know him in the audience? Not very many. He was actually a physician, but a very good intentions regarding health in the auction. So he gathered all breed judges in Sweden for a session where they discussed what do we see in the show rings that put a risk that they, they have, will have health problems. And they came up with a list of what they thought they had to be more aware of at that time. So that then was brought to the next stage. Next. So we did a survey to the Swedish veterinarians to see what did they think was the problem in some breeds. And we combined it also. We have access to good insurance data in Sweden, which you can see on the next slide. We are able to see what's going on in a specific field, and that can highlight and find out. The interesting thing, these lists were very similar. So even though they even at that time see different parts of the population, it indicated where we might have a problem and where we might have to do something together to counteract that. Next. 
actually I was involved together with René Billes also, who also, he was the, 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 the chairman of the Standard Commission for FCI for a long time, and we wrote up the first version that then has been seen many more revisions. So what we did, and it was, I, I can't remember, this was done before Pedido was exposed. Next. There you see what the aim is. Next. And of course, it focuses on things that can be too much, too little, too big and too small, to a great extent. That's where the problem lies when we are not very specific in the terminology in the breed standards or where we have difficulties to interpret the breed standards. Uh, that was taken to being a Nordic uh, initiative. So now the same breed specific instruction is used in all the breed in the, the, the Scandinavian countries. And the revision is made together, and the revision is made as in Sweden together with the breed clubs. So they have an influence on what should be in there. And all of it is, of course, because of the change over time in type. Next. As I was saying what I'm saying. Next. Next. It then has gone spread, so we know now that it's ver versions of it is used in Germany, Holland, New Zealand, and it has been an initiative taken to have it widely spread also in other FCI countries. And I'm very proud of that. It, 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 it has been, to me, a successful approach. Thanks. Next. Uh, the content is quickly. It's an introduction. It discusses the, the basic for all dogs. It does specific things in breed types. It did uh, group them in, in FCI grouping. And we have it also a specific a appendices a specific appendix on how to assess breathing. That was pr produced quite early because we found a need to educate judges in that sense. So that is available on the web, and there was also an, an appendix on, on eye problems, which is a difficulty to handle sometimes. And then it's, of course, also important that we have a reporting system. Next. That's the letter. Is there anyone in the audience have been exposed to, to breed specific instructions? A handful. I can't talk to you afterwards how you find them. Next. And there are some very basic comments in the beginning. Next. It discusses specific problems related to specific uh, condition, specific uh, type of dogs. Next. And it discusses quite extensively how to assess breathing. I don't have time to go through that. I'm just showing what it looks like. I think you, you all can get hold of the breed specific instruction on the web. So you, even before you go judging in Sweden, you can have access to them. And I think it's, it's a good and interesting tool. Next. That was a video I had intended to show because of the time limit, I won't show it. It shows Joran, or oh, I'm that too. We produced that uh, two subs um, something. And, and that's also, available on YouTube. Next. That's that, the appendix on eye problems. Next. There are sections on these specific things. There is also some, some, it's not, it's not a guideline, but it's some comments on how to make use of these findings in your, your, your in the quality grading. Then it comes with yeah, and um, also especially for competing in, in, the, in, the, in the competition assessment. Next. That's an example in uh, a dog where there are a few, some things to be observable on. 
and you can go and see them yourself, and I don't have to go through them. Next. And the reporting process. So I really urge US judges to report back. That's not done just for one day. It's done to be used for the future development within that breed. So make, take your time and do also uh, include it in the written text. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's say and said the same in the critics as it says in the report. Next. That's what I say there. Next. And when we had an evaluation, almost all judges actually wanted them to be on the list still. We have made some changes over the time, but it's we actually picked out uh, probably the most important things. And they will be, be uh, to be for, for a new revision, and maybe that Benke can be involved in the further spread, spreading in the FCI countries. Next. Next. There was an increase in number of uh, uh, disqualified because there was more focus on that. Next. And they serve this purpose especially well in the Bratifali breed. Next. And of course, we would wish that in the future they wouldn't any longer be needed because it was so natural to take that into account in the judging process. Next. A very similar approach has been done at about the same time, actually, in UK. How many have been exposed to breed watch? Yeah, probably the same. All show judges, probably. Yeah, uh, so I wouldn't comment on that, because that was my to not my top kit. But it serves as an early warning system. That was the meaning of it. Next. And the positive outcome so far is, of course, there have been some more changes, to not to result in misunderstanding. And we can at least in Sweden see that the amount of dogs with these problems have diminished. That doesn't mean that it has diminished well enough in the entire population, but we don't see them in the show ring. That means that they can't get married. Next. I threw in a failure here because I think we have a great challenge when it comes to specific exaggerated features. So that will be the part I will end with, and I hope we can come together and do even more in that field. Next. I will go through this um, very quickly because you are all familiar with the coming slides. Do them quite quickly. Next. That's what it looked like. Next. 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 This is done from paintings. Next picture, please. But it also can be seen in postcards over the last 90 years, how dogs have actually changed. So it's as brought up even yesterday, there has been an unfortunate trend in the wrong direction. Next. And that came along with a dramatic increase in some of those breeds at risk. When we did the work in the 60s and 70s, these breeds were not very popular at all. So we, we considered that doing something to exaggerate that animal feature would be a kind of a good sign, but it's less important. Nowadays, it's of great importance because of the number of those dogs. Next. We did another thing in 2012, which I just will bring up quickly. Next. We actually, like this event, tried to bring together various stakeholders so we could discuss what we aimed to together. We, we had the challenge to have a meeting at the same time as a genetic group, 
at the same time as HCI gathered their, their, their uh, commissions and we had the chance to in, encourage a lot of breeders and even authorities and welfare organizations to join us. Since then, we have actually met regularly to discuss problems in common. In, and it's not uh, surprising that at all of these, the exaggerated anatomical features has been on the agenda and been moved and discussed and died to, to much, as much as possible. So please go to just dog well net or just look for IPFD to find out. How many of you in the audience are aware of IPFD and dog well net? No, somewhat more than the, um, it was actually initially an FCI initiative, and I would like to have a, still a support from that from FCI because that would make it much easier to spread out to countries uh, um, to see. Next, please. Next. Now I'm just mentioning quickly two more things before I come with those uh, provocative statements. And that is that, that as a follow-up of bringing stakeholders together, we have found out that having collaborative efforts nationally, bringing stakeholders together nationally, is a very good of, of, of promoting things like that. There are in, in a couple of countries gathering regularly by authorities, by, by, by welfare organization, by kennel clubs and veterinary organization to discuss these matters. And that's a good way of trying to find solutions where we do agree. So what I would encourage you to is to try to form things like that also in your country, for example, in Mexico. And then I, if there is chance later on today, we will show a video production that we very recently have, have, have um, released. We did it actually last week in, in the World Conference for Dogs, Veterinary, Veterinary Conference for Dogs, and that appears the man who you didn't see because he was absent, and it also appears uh, Jane, as you have met, and I will be in it too. So I hope that we can sneak it in later today. I'm just announcing it. Let's say a few words about that, that uh, collaborative, collaborative uh, on in extreme confirmation. Next. 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 And you can find it, and you find it under IPFT. So if you go to IPFT, you can also find this, find this well patch. It's actually initiative from IPFT. Next. So, there has been a lot of things done for to counteract BOAS over the years. There has even been a book on these issues, which I encourage you to get hold of and have a look at. But it's not enough. It's not enough. We are still, by that, challenge it by the the media, by, by the, the welfare organization, because the, we have still have the problem we have seen and we all know about. Next. A tool that you got acquainted with um, just, um, yesterday was the testing system. That's an excellent tool. And you, I really hope that will be, be spread. And I know that the next step is taken in Mexico, and I hope it will be widely spread. Because that's, that's, that's a way where veterinarians can help breeders to, to, prove, to select them. Next. So we have had a lot of success, but we have also had failure. And the greatest failure to me has been that it has created a polarization. It has created polarization between vets and show yardies. Not looking at the question with the same eyes. And that's reasonable, it should be seen from different angles. But the result of it should actually be, hopefully, for the best of the dogs together. Next, very quickly. The problem why it's, it's a polarization is probably because we do see different parts of the same population. Next. 
The veterinarians see their sick ones. The show judges hopefully see the good ones at dog shows. And the breeders only see their own dogs. Next. And that will, of course, affect the, the perception of the extent. That's why it, some denies that isn't a problem, because we don't see it. But it also affects the support for measures to be taken. Let's work together. Next. The sad story is, to me, that even though legal actions might be needed and might support this, and even though testing for breeding stock will help, it's not enough. The most important thing is to change the perception of a dog in these breeds. And that's, we have a, a, a trade to go. Next. That change has to be seen in the ones who want to acquire a dog. It certainly has to, to regard the breeders, but it also has to affect those who give advice, both show judges and veterinarians. Next. Now I come to this uh, little provocative statement. There might be a gap between the consumer's demand for a well-behaving, healthy dog pup of a desired type. That's what he, why he writes. And maybe what the breeders do produce because they knew that they would be in, in the show dogs. That's making show dogs very important that they stay to the basic needs. And the, and I, I take another one. I have taken one property. The prescribed and rewarded features nowadays is maybe too close. And because it's a continue, uh, it, it, it's a polyonic thing. If you stay too close, but it's harmful, you will always have harm the terrorist dog. They might not show up in the show rings, but they show up in, in the public and are seen by the public. Next. And that calls for joint actions. Next. One way of handling that is, of course, like this, bringing stakeholders together so that they meet each other and can understand each other's view on things. And uh, especially those who have dual hats. How many audience are show judges and veterinarians? That gives me hope. You are the ambassadors of bridging this gap between these, these groups. It's very important that you take your responsibility in that sense. Next. Regarding BUAS, it's of course to have them in the right section, but still breed specific features. We have touched that, but it's tricky. And my request to the others, please do not reward individuals with any anatomy clues to the risk. And please even sometimes accept those not in your mind the most beautiful, but maybe they could do better. Next. And this lists how we all have a joint in, uh, responsibility, all the way down to the kennel clubs. Next. Which eventually will result, result that we will see less affected dogs, which needed not to have the authorities and the welfare uh, hunting us. Next. Well, someone said that I shouldn't show this, but I couldn't resist. It is the end of the talk, but I also want to say there are risks at dog shows related to exaggerated anatomical features in man. This is taken from the dog show. I'll, I'll stop there. I, Thank I, I, you. Don't, I, I don't dare to be more provocative now. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. Yeah. I'm having a question because I happily filled many BSI documents in the last decades when I was judging because I really think it's a very good idea. 
I would like to ask you or your help uh, because I never seen a statistical analysis of the results how much and how it's changed during the years so if you have any kind of statistics which which proves this system to work well we would love to have it in the FCI office because that can be used in our favor in the future yes we have tried of course to make follow-ups on what's going on you saw an early evaluation of it so to our in our mind it has really affected the amount of bad dogs that dog shows. Then it's even more difficult to find out if that's affecting the general population. Yeah, and I promise you that that with the effective Nordic uh, group now working on it, are heavily working on how to standardize that, how to make it up. So we can feed back and say this is the way to go. Yes, we will work on it. Any other questions? I think that Venke is in that group now. Uh, no, I don't think so. At least but I have. You should, you should be. <laughs> well, then you have to suggest it. I will happily contribute to that work. But because, as Thomas said, I also uh, I breed a, a BSI breed myself, the Basset Hound, for many years, and I also fill them out as judges. Uh, coming from one of the countries that is a BSI country. The problem, I think, is that the Nordic Kennel Clubs need to do something with the handling of the BSI document because the judges are doing their work, they're filling out the BSI document, it's being sent to the Kennel Club, but it's, and I'm from the Norwegian Kennel Club myself, so I'm going a little bit against my own Kennel Club now, but I'm, I'm as provocative as Orke sometimes, so I will dare to do it. Because the problem is that it's not put in motion to use really in statistics and coming from, I was the president of the Bassett Hound Club for nine years and it's something happens in the interaction between the breed club and the kennel club because all the BSI reports that come into the kennel club is not put into a system that again can be used from the breed club. And that is very pity because this is a really great document and we also read it in the Health and Welfare Committee of the FCI and we tried to push it for further use. But as Thomas said, it has some faults that need to be corrected because we haven't seen a good result and good statistics for it yet in any of the northern countries. So if you can push that or you can make me in that group, I will push that. Sure, I'll do my best. Um, Sweden being a little bit for, before uh, Norway, I know have a reporting system, but we have a good feedback to the breed clubs and a feedback to the judges, but that could be improved. Yeah, let, let, let's bring it up. Is there any other comments? Okay, we'll just take one last question because we are running late, so. Yeah, I would like to thank you, Ake, because your work in the recent years was amazing and uh, what you presented here, it was a beautiful historical overview of the veterinarian association, what they are doing for the healthy breeding in the, some diseases like uh, elbow, hip, or an eye. So we show with this collaboration that veterinarian can help to the kennel organizations because when we start launching these programs for preventing disease in, in the breeding programs, we show success. So my question to you, when we apply knowledge, what we are doing, that we reduce hip dysplasia in the most working dogs, that our nowadays police, army, um, and, uh, and the therapeutic dogs, at least can be sure that with the selection, they will not suffer from hip or elbow dysplasia of eye problem. So if we apply same strategy, that cannot club take the rule plus veteran organization. Do you think that we can succeed at least in the 10 to 15 years in the preventing of the BOAS and other confirmation disease what we face today? Uh, take the first part first. Regarding hips and elbows, I think we have a functioning system which I know in the working um, dog's world functions well. 
they have very rarely hip dysplasia in this armed force or the successor of armed force learning in Sweden. Whether we should um, have a success in the breeding programs for BOAS depends to a great extent, and I'm saying it again, on you as judges. If you, together with the legal actions, together with the testing system, please try to influence the perception of a good dog in those breeds, we certainly could have a success together. But that means it has to be given up other eyes which were put on because of tradition. So once again, you are very important in this process and I hope that you, you join efforts to make it just by your. I want to thank the FCI board members for giving Mexico the opportunity of having this important World Congress for Welfare and Health for the dogs worldwide. We are really pleased and thank you so much for giving us this great opportunity. And also I want to thank all the speakers from all over the world who participate in this great event. Thank you.